Good morning, everyone. Yeah. Well, that's loud. Uh, <clears throat> you might have to excuse me from time to time if I cough, uh, just not feeling 100%. But am I work out good for you? Because that would mean I don't, I'm not as loud uh, today. So please, you, you'll have to excuse me if I do cough. Um, but let's, let's pray, and then we can begin um, with the Word of God. Father, we thank you <clears throat> so much, Lord, that what we can offer you is absolutely nothing but ourselves. We offer ourselves as uh, Christ, Lord God, has given his life to us. Uh, we offer ourselves to you, uh, Lord God, because of Christ's sacrifice. We can give you nothing. Everything was done for us, and everything that we have does not belong to us, Lord. This morning we pray that you will open up our hearts and our mind, uh, Lord, to receive your word and to, to receive it with re readiness, uh, Lord God, and to be sure, Father, this is what your word says. We believe that the word of God is inspired, it is God-breathed, and we want to hear your voice today, Father. And so we pray, Father, for those who are visiting as well, they may be blessed <clears throat> in hearing your voice through your word. And we ask that you will bless this in Jesus' name. Amen. For those of you who are visiting, we have been making our way through 1 John. So we are at the end of 1 John um, in chapter 5. And it's been such a great blessing for me to share this whole five chapters. It's been such an honor. Um, what, a, what a great little journey we've had um, through 1 John. And for those of you who are visiting, uh, I would encourage to, to listen to the 23 sermons that we preached on before perhaps you could understand this one today. It will make more sense. But in light of last week's, before we even read our text for this morning, I'm going to be a little bit unorthodox today, okay, in, in, in the preaching. So bear with me. And hopefully it, it all makes a little bit of sense. But in light of last week and the whole of the epistle of John, John as has... As a shepherd, his desire is for the people of God to know, to know, to have this assurance. And as we come to, to the postscript, so to speak, from verse um, uh, 14 to 21 this morning, we will see John doing that yet again. And John, through this whole epistle, has said that we may know that we have eternal life. And we can know our eternal estate. We can know our eternal home, our eternal abode, our resting place. And we can know that we have that and we will be in the presence of Christ and of the Lamb of God and of God himself forever. But John has shared with us through this epistle that we can know him as we obey and we can know that we know him because he works in us. And we can know that we know him as we practice righteousness. And we know him because we know the Father and the Spirit that dwells in us. And as, as John then begins to end this letter, he wants to end the letter with assurance and with hope. So read with me these few verses, but I'll, 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 there are three things that John wants to bring forth here. But we are going to concentrate on one today, but I'll share what they are with you, and then perhaps you can read it on your own time and study it a bit deeper. But read with me from verse 14. Remember in light of last week, these things are written, verse 13, to you, who believe in the name of the Son of God. Brother John called us the verse 13ers. And I believe that's because that is the purpose statement of the whole of the epistle and all those who pass those tests and so forth, for those of you who have been following, fit in his category. But from verse 14, we see John saying, this is the confidence which we have before him that if we ask anything according to his will, he will hear us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from him. If anyone sees a brother committing a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask God, and God will give him life to those who commit sin, not leading to death. 
Uh, there is a sin leading to death, and I do not say that you should make a request for this. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not leading to death. We know, we know that no one who is born of God sins, but he who is born of God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. And we know we are from God, and the whole world lies under the power of the evil one. And we know the Son of God has come, and he has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true, and we or in Him who is true, in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true and eternal God. Our little children, guard yourselves from idols. There are three things. Here's the first one that John wants us to know here. In verse 20 and, 20 and, and 21, that he's been saying all along, that we may know the true God. This epistle is Christ's epistle. It is about knowing the true God and being sure that we have the true God because this is crucial for salvation. It is not to know that Jesus was a good man and Jesus was a good person or a good teacher or a created being or the Son of God who came into being at one point in time and in contrast with the false teachers who were denying the deity of Christ. John wants the church to say, we know the Creator. There is no option. John is saying here in verse 20, we know that the Son of God has come. And we know Him. He is the true God. There is no other gods. There is no other name amongst men by which we must be saved. And John brings that right at the back of his epistle as the postscript to the whole letter to make sure that we understand that this Jesus that's been proclaimed through the whole epistle is the one true God. That's one thing that John wants to share. But also, if we know this true God, if we understand this true God, that is in the person of Jesus Christ, as you see that in verse 18 and 19, no one who is born of God sins. That means this God... This God whom we believe sanctifies his children. Now, that doesn't mean you are sinless. We've touched on this before. For those of you who are perhaps fami not, not familiar with First John, John has spoken about this before many times. Sinning here is an active verb. It's a continuous sin. And what John is saying here, not that the Christian becomes sinless, but he becomes sinless. He sins less. We've touched on that before, right? He, not that he's perfect, but because he's born of God, according to the verse 19 here and 18, we can have victory over sin. Because the same God who actually took you from death and gave you life, it is the same God who sanctifies you. He that began the good work in you will bring it to perfection. And God says he will never leave you, and he will never forsake you. And he is divine, and you are the branch, and God will make you holy in accordance to his own purpose and his own time. These are a couple of things that John wants to talk about. But there is one third thing that I really want to focus on this morning. And then John wants his readers to know these truths. He wants us to know that we're born again. He wants us to know that we have eternal life. He wants us to know that we are sanctified in Christ. He wants us to know that one day we will be in glory with Christ. He wants us to know that we should anticipate for these truths. But until we receive it fully, until we go home and be with the Lord and this tent is done away with, there is one more thing that John says here. This is the confidence which we have before him that if we ask. So John wants us to know about prayer. It's about prayer. Does God hear my prayers? Whilst I'm living on this planet, does God hear prayers? Who can pray to God? Who are the prayers? Now, who can actually come before the throne of God and God will listen to their prayers? As we finish First John, I pray that this, this one section of here, I, I thought I'll take 
uh, the focus and put it here on prayer because there are so many believers who struggle in understanding how to pray. I thought I'd take the time and, and share that with you this morning. So I titled this, Does God Hear Prayers? So I've got three things. Prayers, what is prayer and what is not, I guess. That is number one. Two, who qualifies for the prayers? And three, answered prayers. What are they? Who has these prayers answered? So when we read from verse 14, this is the confidence that we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, hear, he will hear us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked of him. We can ask anything, he hears us. Ask God and he hears you. But we, before we get into that, who are these people? I thought it would be good to understand a little bit about what prayer is actually not. What prayer is not. Prayer is not a feel-good remedy. Now, prayer is good for the soul, but for different reasons. Not so, that, so much so that you feel good when you pray. That is not prayer. You come in some sort of like meditation or some sort of taking a, a pill, a tablet for a headache that makes you feel better. That is not prayer. Prayer is not a wish. Prayer is not a wish that you come to God and you say to yourself, God, I wish I had a different husband. God, I wish I had a different wife. God, I wish I had a different life. I had a different child or a different job. You fill in the blanks. The third thing, prayer is not for changing God's mind. Prayer is not for changing God's mind. It, 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 some often think that we come before God, the God of the universe who knows all things, understands all things, is in control of all things, is glorious in all of His way, that when we come up to Him and we pray, we can change His mind. And this type of thinking, by the way, what happens is, is that you become God. You are the one who sets the rules. And some of you who went street ministry with us yesterday will probably know that some people, when you talk to them, they say, well, why does God allow a worm to be in the eye of a little baby in Uganda? And what they're really saying is, if I ask God to remove that, he should remove it. And if he doesn't remove it, I can do a better job. And so what happens is this is a, this is a mindset that has creeped up in, in the actual churches of Christ, where I ask God and I pray to God and He will change His mind according to mine. James says, you ask and you, you do not receive because when you ask, you, run, you ask with the wrong motives. You ask for the wrong things, for your own pleasure. The other thing, what prayer is not, Prayer is not some religious acts. Prayer is not a religious act. I come from Italy, and there is a place in Naples. That's my city where I come from. Now, hear me out. It's not wrong for you to pray for healing if you're a Christian, okay? So just put that out of the, out of the equation. I am talking religious acts. I'm talking a person who walks and, and my heart breaks for hours on end on gravel on their knees so that they can get through a picture of some, whoever saint you believe in at that time, so that because they've done this religious act, they will be healed. I, I, I don't know what healing you would ask for, but you will have to ask for healing for your legs by the time you get there because they're going to be broken, <laughs> you know. And that's sad. That is not what prayer is. The other thing I'd like to point out to some of the Brothers and sisters, which I've heard this so many times. Let, let, me, let me just say this with love. Prayer is not a neglect of your duty as a father, brother, mother, or sister. 
Let me explain to you what I mean by that. Well, my child who lives in that room, I know he's headed for hell. I don't talk to him about Jesus. I just pray for him. Do you see the problem? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Prayer is slightly different. I am not telling you do not pray for your child or your annoying husband or your annoying wife. I'm not saying that. But often I'll just pray and we neglect our own duties as Christians. Does that make sense? This is a couple of things I wanted to share with you. What prayer is not. According to verse 14, this is the confidence which we have before him that if we ask anything according to his will. A prayer is according to God's will. And often the duties, like I said, you know, with us, we, we pray and we say, let's just say that you have a, a family member who's not saved. I'm pretty sure most of you have. And perhaps a child, your son or your wife or your daughter. Or, and you say, Lord, please, they're hanging around with a bad crowd. Take away that crowd from them that they can come to save in faith. But could it be perhaps that God wants to break your child because that's not his will. His will is not to remove that group. His will is perhaps to break your child. It could be that, could it not? Sometimes we pray for the husband. We say, Lord, please make my husband, and you, you fill in the blanks, or make my wife this way. But could it be that God's will at that point is to humble you? Perhaps that you be a submissive wife? Or for the husband to pull up his socks if he's praying for his wife to be submissive, vice versa? Sometimes we think that we know better than God. Prayer is having a desire for God's will in our lives according to his will. And any believer who is growing will understand that. Anyone who has had the new birth will know that in the affection for Christ, they will lean towards Christ and they will pray so that God will be glorified in their lives no matter what it takes. This takes growth, right? But this is what John wants to speak to us here this morning. Jesus spoke, Father, if you are willing to remove this cup, nevertheless, not my will, but yours. We often quote that, but we quote that it's just Jesus does that. We don't do that. We're meant to pray and follow our master. Prayer is not desiring God to change his mind to yours. Prayer is rather that God changes your mind to his. That's what prayer is. And Jesus spoke these wonderful words. He lifted up his eyes into heaven in John 17, 1, and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. Your prayer should be like that. Our prayer should be that God is glorified in you. One commentator put it really beautiful. This is what prayer is, talking to God and listening to him. I love that. Prayer is talking to God and listening to him. We often get it all wrong. One other thing I really believe it's not spoken enough of is prayer is joyful. You know, prayer is joyful. Now, we often think Prayer is a drag. And, uh, I just got to pray. Let me hurry up. Let me pray because I got a busy day. I got a joyful day ahead of me, but prayer is joyful. Jesus says, Until now you've asked for nothing in John 16 24 in my name. Ask, pray, and you'll receive. Why? So that your joy may be made full. In prayer, there is joyfulness, there is joy. Jesus says, pray. Why? Why is there joy in prayer? Because Jesus Christ is joyful. God is joy. God is not some depressed old man in the sky who has to somehow make himself joyful by playing PlayStation. He is the fullness of joy. 
The other thing that prayer is, is fellowship and longing to seek after God. Jesus, he goes and, and he's preaching the gospel. He's healing. He's feeding many. He does all these wonderful miracles. And yet, at the end of the day, Jesus sat in prayer all night in fellowship with the Father. But some of us, when we have a hard day, we want to go home, and I don't know what you do, but, you know, it's usually the, the man sits on the couch, sits the TV on, and he's brain dead. You know, Jesus sat down, and he had fellowship with the Father. After a busy day, I've got to go in prayer with the Father. Prayer is the acknowledgement and your need for Christ. Your need for Christ. In Luke 18, 13, of course, he's talking about a sinner coming to save him faith. He says, a tax collector standing some distance away, when even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Prayer is our, should be our desire to actually want Christ, need him. We need him. So who are these people that qualify? That's the first point. Who are the people that qualify? Who are those people then that God will answer these prayers? Who are they? Let's have a look. I'm still stuck in verse 14, by the way. Let's have a look at verse 14. This is the confidence which we have before him that if we ask anything according to his will, he will hear us. Who can approach God? Who can approach God? These are the people in verse 13, if you go back and you remember what we spoke about, these are the ones who know that they have eternal life, they believe in God. They can have confidence. Now, I want to ask you, if you're not a believer, if you're not a Christian, all right, if you're not born of God, and we'll explain that in a minute, what kind of confidence can you have to come before a God whom you don't know? Can you have confidence? No. John has already explained his confidence in verse chapter 3, verse 21, when he says, Beloved, even if your heart condemns us, we have that confidence before God. We have a confidence, according to Hebrews, to draw near the throne of grace. We have full access before the throne of God, according to Ephesians 3.12. And this confidence means we have the freedom of speech, the boldness of speaking to God, the boldness in approaching God. This is a relational right, approach. It is not that you are distant from God, you are close to God. And I'll quote you one man who wrote this, and I thought that was beautiful, speaking about who are these people who can have this confidence. He says, the boldness, quote, with which the Son appears before the Father, not that which the accused before the judge. Did you get that? The people of God are approaching their Holy Father. They're the ones who qualify to have their prayers Answered. We can know that God hears. We can know that He hears us. And that we have the request that we've made of Him because we actually belong to Him. We belong to Him. And here are these people. They have confidence. Verse 20, I'll just read it for you. We know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding that we may know Him who is true. We know Him. And verse 18 says, No one who is born of God. Who are those who qualify? Ladies and gentlemen, they are the ones who are born of God. The ones who have their air prayers answered are the ones who are born of God. Those who have a new nature. 
those who have the new passions and new heart, those who have come from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, those who have been adopted in Christ Jesus, those who are now heirs of Christ and have eternal light, life, those who have fellowship with Christ and walk in the light, those who love God, those who love the brothers, those who are protected by God, those who understand that Jesus Christ is the only God in contrast with the idols. These are the people who can qualify before God. First Peter says this, but the eyes of the Lord are towards the righteous and his ears attend their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. You say, well, Ralph, what happens to an unbeliever? Well, like I said in Luke, the prayer that God will answer for you as an unbeliever is one of repentance. It is a prayer that you will say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Have mercy on me. I have failed you, God. I cannot do any good works. It doesn't matter how often you go to church. It doesn't matter how much you read the Bible. It doesn't matter how many times you light a candle. It doesn't matter what you do. You must come to God broken and say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I cannot enter into your presence because I am undone. I'm unclean. I am not perfect. And you put yourself at the mercy of God. And Jesus Christ says, this man, this one here, he goes, I am justified. That's the prayer that will answer. God will answer. And we pray that all the people that we reached out to will pray that prayer. And most of us prayed with them yesterday. And we pray that God will have mercy on them. That's the prayer that God will answer. I had a blessing to speak to, to a lady. I won't name the religion that she had for several reasons. Well, she said, we believe in the same God. She said, he's not your God merciful. I said, 100%. I said, my God is so merciful. I said, but he's also just. And justice has to be paid. So I had to paint her a picture. I won't get into it. I took her to the courtroom to a point where I became a murderer of her own child. And I said, but if God lets me free, if that judge sets me free on the account of him being loving and merciful and good, I said, where's his justice? Why? We need to understand God is merciful and God is loving and God is kind. He is so kind that Christ came and dwelt amongst us, correct? Right? So that those who will put their faith and trust in him will not perish but have everlasting life. But we need to come to God on His terms, not on our terms. Those are the prayers that God answers. And if we have not entered into that personal relationship with Christ, then why would God listen to your prayers? Why should God listen to your prayers? Why? You don't want this God this lady said to me, God bless her heart, and I pray God will deal with her. She said, my God will say no unto hell. And I said, and I'm scared for that. I said, because you've broken one of the commandments of God. You've made a, a God, a false God. You, you're worshiping a, an idol. It's a scary thought. Only those who belong to Christ, who have born of God, can approach the throne with confidence. And you can this morning, brothers and sisters. You have access to the throne of God. You can have assurance this morning. And for those of you who have not understood what I said, please come and talk to me a bit more a bit later. And I can explain to you what I mean. That you must be born again. Five words. Remember those five words? And Jesus made that very clear. In actual fact, he made it so clear that he said, you won't even see the kingdom of God you do not enter it unless you are born of the Spirit of God, unless you are a new creature.
creation in Christ Jesus. So let's look at our next point, which will take us a little bit longer. So here we got prayers. We have those who will qualify for prayers. Now let's have a look at the answered prayers. What are the prayers that God answers? Look with me in verse 15. Uh, perhaps 16 to 18, we'll read it together. And if we know that He hears our, us, and whatever we ask, we know that we have a request which we have asked from Him. If anyone sees a brother committing a sin or leading to death, he shall ask, and God will give him life to those committing sin, not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say you should make a request for this. Or sin, or unrighteousness rather, is sin, and there is a sin not leading to death, and so forth. What a beautiful promise. Did you understand that? God says, pray to me, and I will listen to you. Pray to me, and I will listen to you. And he says, I will listen to anything, all your prayers, all your prayers, all of them, according to his will. This should humble us. The holy God of creation says, come and pray to me and I will hear you. Now we can rest assured that we will receive according to God's will, according to his word, whatever we ask for because it is according to his will and that will give him glory. But I want to give you a couple of pointers perhaps to understand the prayers of God will answer. Number one, we see that in a minute that you're praying for your brother. You're praying for your brother. But let me give you some verses that will help us understand praying in God's will. Jesus said, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup, right? Nevertheless, not my will, but your will. That's a prayer that you will say to God, Even if it kills me, I want to fulfill your will. We don't really pray like that, do we? We don't say, God, if it's your will, take me out of this planet so I can fulfill your will and uh, may your kingdom come and, uh, you know, your will be done and you'll be glorified. The other thing, as we read in 1 John 3, 22, it says, Whatever we ask, we receive of Him because we keep His commandments and do the things that are pleasing to Him. God's will is that we would obey, that we'll be obedient. God listens to the obedient Christian. Does that make sense, right? I don't know if you've come across any unbeliever or a believer claims to be a believer, and yet he's living it up, he's doing drugs, and he's going out partying, and he's getting drunk. Yeah, he will pray to God. I'm not sure what kind of prayer you could pray to God when you're disobedient to God, and why should God answer that prayer? God listens to the prayers of the saints when they are confessing their sins. God will honor and listens to the prayers of the saints who do not continue in sin according to this verse, and through 1 John, as we have looked at. Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that my Father is glorified. These are the prayers that are according to God's will. Now, John moves a little bit more specific here, which we want to look at. I spoke to a brother this week, and we were, we were working out who are these people to sin unto death and, and unto life. So, Look at that with me for a minute. Let's have a look at the prayers that God answers. At verse 16, if you see a brother. Now, straight away, look at that. What's the concern? You're not looking at yourself. You're looking at a brother. And you're not looking at a brother who is holy and perfect. What's he doing? If you see a brother committing a sin, wow, that's love. That's compassion. That's caring. And most of us, you know what happens to us? We see a brother committing a sin and go, whoa, did you see? I don't, know. I don't know what he's up to. Is it not? You become judgmental in your heart. Your self-righteous Pharisee comes out of you because you're so holy and you cannot commit that sin, right? Oh, okay, it's just me. All right. And John, 
Sorry, brother. I'll put you on here. <laughs> well, here's what it says. If anyone sees a brother committing a sin or leading to death, he shall ask God, and God will give him life to those who commit a sin or leading to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I do not say you should make a request for that. Of course, all sin and all unrighteousness is sin. Now, this is, this is a blessing of a prayer that God will bless and God will hear. It is called a selfless prayer of intercession. This is a selfless prayer. This is a focus on your brother, on your sister. It's not about you. It's not about you at all. It has nothing to do with you. It's you coming on your knees not praying for your health and wealth and prosperity, is getting on your knees and you see your brother broken. And you see him in trouble because sin clings to him and it hurts you. And you weep for him, not for you because he's annoying you. It is because he's not in fellowship with God. Is this not what we've heard all along? In this epistle, to love your brother and to pray for him, serve him in prayer. And this is a sweet smelling aroma into the nostrils of our Lord. Will you take the focus of you? And if you read carefully, verse 16, it says, Your prayer is answered not according to him. It says, I will hear that prayer because of you. You're praying. God listens to your prayer. If anyone sees a brother committing sin, not leading to death, he shall ask God, and God will give him life to those who commit sin. God will do it because of your prayer. And he will give him life. So easy. We, the older we get in Christ, only two things can happen. One, you become more self-righteous. Or two, you become more humble and you see your own sin all the greater. And when you see that sin all the greater and you see the grace of God all the greater, only then you can see your brother and sister in trouble. Or else there is no grace. You might as well preach law. If anyone sees his brother, this is a, this is a brother who is in Christ committing a sin. Don't get caught up in self-righteous, and all of a sudden, you have a, a gossip party. This is sin. You start talking to bro a brother or sister who is in need of help, and you'll gossip, and you'll talk, but he's fallen. Rather than pray for them, you will pray to whom? To other brothers and sisters and talk about them? No. Get on your knees with God. Close the door and weep for your brother that he may be restored back in fellowship with God. And of course here, there are two types of sin that it speaks about, a sin leading to death and a sin that leads to life. And there are different views on this. I'll, I'll, I will give them to you quickly. Some say that this is a person who is a non-believer, a sin leading to death, um, it's talking about basically the rejection of Christ, uh, which we have seen in 1 John 2.19. Uh, they went out from us, but they were not really from us. Perhaps John had that in mind. Uh, nobody really knows what John had in mind. Uh, so there, there, there is a different school of thoughts here. Um, John, 1 John, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. Uh, so some believe that this is talking about a rejection of, of of Christ, the sin leading to death. Uh, you can look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. If we go on sinning uh, deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. And of course, you can look at yourself. I'm not sure where you stand on chapter 6, uh, uh, 4 to 6 of Hebrews where it says, if these people have fallen away from the grace of God, they shared, they came so close to salvation, I believe they're number, unbelievers, and God ultimately hardens their hearts to a point where there is no return. That's one view that people have. So the sin unto death is an unbeliever. The sin unto life 
is a believer who needs to be restored back into the fellowship. Uh, others say, however, the second view I just want to share with you quickly, others say that the sin unto death is, is a physical death for the believer. And you can read that in a few verses. I'll mention them to you. Uh, there is one in 1 Corinthians um, chapter 5, verse 5. You are to deliver such a man uh, to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. That is a man who got caught up in sexual immorality. And of course, when we come to the Lord's Supper, as many times we have mentioned um, chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, where it speaks of people coming to the Lord in an unworthy manner in the Lord's Supper. They were getting drunk, and Paul warns them. He says, some of you are sick, and some of you have fallen asleep. So these are the two views of who these people are. Here's the problem. It's sin. Both of them are in sin. So here's my, here's my, here's my conclusion to this. Because I don't want to be dogmatic. I know I have my opinion, but I'm not going to say it. And I won't be dogmatic. But I can tell you this. If this is a believer, get down on your knees and pray for the believer. If it's an unbeliever, get down on your knees and pray for the unbeliever that he may become a believer. So I think they're both correct. They are biblically both correct. I'm not sure what John meant. Like I said, I do have my own opinion. But... That's okay. We'll leave that for next time, perhaps, and maybe we can talk about it later on. So, uh, so I, I believe that, that that's, that's what John is saying here. It's really about prayer and that we should offer up our prayers uh, unto the Lord um, either way because we believe in a true God. But when we're talking about God's will, all right, I want to talk about it just as an application, as a way of an application as we close off this, which is about prayer. Often pre people will pray only when I say if it's God's will, it's often God's sovereign will. Like, I don't know what God is going to do, which is fair enough, correct? But God has given us a revealed will, which is in his word. So there are those things in which we can pray, and one of them is a brother. God is telling us, if your brother commits sin, correct? Go and pray for I mean, is it, this not the Word of God? The Word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. The Word of God will not come back and return to him void. This is the Word of God. It's God-breathed. And so God tells us to pray, pray for the brother. Well, then according to 1 John, as we are coming to a close of this wonderful little epistle in which I just took one little focus today for the sake of time, then how about we meditate on what we learned? What should we pray for? Well, pray. God's revealed will in this little epistle that we studied was for fellowship. That's God's will. If we ask anything according to God's will, He will hear us. According to this little five-chapter little epistle, we have learned that God's will is fellowship. So we can pray for fellowship. But not just between you and Jesus. We can pray for fellowship with one another with Saving Grace Bible Church. God has revealed to us in his little epistle that we should walk in the light and not the darkness. We should pray that we walk in the light and we don't fall in love with the world. God has revealed to us in this little epistle that we should outdo one another in love, serve one another in love. We should pray for service for one another. God has revealed to us that we should live righteously for Him. And we should pray for that. God has revealed to us that we should be aware of false doctrine. Know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. 
We should pray that we may grow in the knowledge of God's word, that we may know truth from error, that we may know the true Christ and then share that true Christ with other people. We looked at overcoming the world. Pray for one another. Pray that you will become an overcomer. Why? Because God says you can, and that's God's will. And you can do all this because you are in Christ. Moses said this, I pray that you show me your glory. May this be our focus, that our desire is to align all that is within us and that surpasses all this world, that God himself will open the skies and we would desire to see his glory revealed to us in our lives. Here's my question to you then. Do you pray? How often do you pray? Think for a minute in your own heart and your own head. How much time do you spend in beautiful, quality time with Christ? Think about it. Think about your daily day of living. 20 minutes, 25 minutes, in a whole seven days I'm talking about. Two, are you one of the people that are qualified to approach this God? If you're not born again, I would encourage you once again to understand this a bit more, to come and talk to me afterwards. I will share with you the gospel. But it it may be perhaps if you're a Christian today that God is not listening to your prayers, maybe because you're in sin. Could be that. Not pointing fingers. But let's finish with this. Whatever you're praying for, Pray in God's will, not yours, that he may hear it and he will answer it and give what you've asked for. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for these few minutes that you've given us. Oh, Lord, how foolish we can be. Oh, Lord, how silly we can be that we have the throne of God opened for us. We have the riches of heaven at our disposal. We have the God who needs nothing, who does not need me or us, and yet he offers all things to us because we are your children. As we finish this little epistle, Father, we have had many tests and examination, challenges and encouragements, Lord. Oh, Lord, that we will pray according to your will, that we will live fully for our Lord Jesus Christ, that he will rest upon us, and that we will pray and join Moses and say, Lord, show me your glory. Show me Christ. Oh, Father, there will be nobody here this morning who is not a child of you, who is not born of God, that they will come to an understanding that the prayer that they must pray is one of repentance, turning from sin, clinging to Christ, knowing their eternal abode is hell. And yet you send your Son, Christ Jesus, as a lamb ready to be slaughtered. And it pleased you to crush your only Son, For what? So that we may have life in him and communion with him. Please, Father, I pray that everybody here, Lord God, heard you this morning and will be in prayer with you through Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.